Good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone for uh, our webinar from the Piłsudski Institute of America from um, New York City. Uh, we are here meeting today with our um, guest, um, Peter Hatterlington, who is uh, connecting uh, with us from Texas, right? From Houston. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to welcome our guest. Hello, uh, Mr. Hatterington. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for uh, taking the invitation and being with us tonight. Um, before I will introduce our guest, I will say a few words about the Institute, because I may assume that not everyone visited the Institute yet. So, uh, Piłsudski Institute of America is a non-for-profit educational center located in New York City. We uh, have been funded in 1943 by friends of uh, Joseph Piłsudski and by uh, Polonian activists. Our main mission is to uh, preserve and make available historical documents and we have uh, 1 million documents in our archives at this moment. We have very large library with 20,000 volumes and uh, extensive artifacts and uh, art gallery, which you can see parts of it behind me with a great um, paintings by Wojciech Kosak Piłsudski on a Kasztanka horse. Um, uh, we usually have a lot of meetings, educational meetings and documentary film screenings uh, here at the Institute, but because of pandemic, we are meeting online. So I invite everyone to visit uh, the Institute when the time is right. And uh, for the time being, uh, look up at our programs online. And in a few weeks, you will see also this program being put into the film on our YouTube. Uh, please visit us at www.pilsudski.org. Um, so this is about the Institute. And now um, I turn to our guest and I will introduce uh, Peter Hatterington. Our lecture today is called The Battle of Warsaw, Miracle of Turning Point That Would Not Turn. Uh, Peter Hatterington is the author of the book Unvanquished, Joseph Piłsudski Re Resurrected Poland and the Struggle for Eastern Europe. This book was published a uh, few years ago, and I have it here ready to show you. So this is the book in English. And just a few months ago, there is a Polish edition being published, which is called Niezłomny. Józef Piłsudski, Odrodzona Polska i Walka Europy Wschodnią. Um, Peter Hatterington is a uh, geologist living in Houston, Texas, and Asheville, North Carolina. He is from Danville, Illinois, and received degrees in geology from the University of Illinois and University of Kentucky. After 11 years at Chevron, he began working for water, oil, and gas in 1992, where he is still employed. Although he is not of Polish descent, Mr. Hatterington developed an interest in Polish history because of its unique and little known contribution to Western civilization. And today we will find out uh, why he is interested in Polish history, why he wrote the book, and he will present a beautiful presentation and lecture regard regarding Battle of Warsaw. So, Mr. Hatterington, the floor is yours. You can share your presentation and we will all listen to you. I also have one note. Uh, everyone would like to post a question. Can use Q&A option uh, with Zoom or can uh, use chat? And then uh, I will read the questions by the end of the presentation. Uh, so we can start now. Okay, is uh, my screen shared? Yes, it is. Okay. All right, so I'm speaking to you from my office. So uh, if the cleaning people come in, uh, I'll have to kind of shoo them away. But thank you. It's a, it's a uh, 
pleasure to speak to you here today. As you know, I'm the author of Unvanquished, and that in that I am neither of Polish descent nor a historian. A reasonable question is, why would someone like me write a biography of Joseph Piłsudski? The short answer is that through independent study, I came to admire Piłsudski in Poland and thought that their story should be better known. During this presentation, I'll expand on that explanation a bit, but the main focus will be on the 1920 Battle of Warsaw. Back to the origins of Unvanquished. While I'm a geologist, not a historian, I've always had an interest in history. And as one of my hobbies, I collect medals from countries that fought in World War I that I organize based on central powers and allied powers. At some point, I acquired a Polish medal from this era. And I asked myself a simple, if ignorant question, which side did Poland fight for in the First World War? Uh, answering this question took me on a convoluted course that led to the book. I discovered that the answer to the question was both and neither. Individual Poles fought on both sides of the war, and both sides had specially designated Polish units. But in 1914, of course, Poland did not exist. That's something that I didn't know. The historic Polish nation, which existed only in the abstract, was neutral in the war in that it was only interested in weakening the powers that had partitioned her. I further learned that Poland had dominated and defined the borderlands of Western civilizations for centuries, a major continental power that had on more than one occasion saved Europe from, war, from foreign domination, uh, most notably Sobieski's lifting of the siege of Vienna in 1683. Poland also pioneered many of the concepts that we associate with classical liberalism, such as limited government, elected rulers, and individual rights. But the republic's neighboring empires partitioned Poland in 1795, and for over 100 years, Poland was ruled by foreign governments. Although usually mentioned as an aside, at least in the books that I read, I discovered that Poland emerged from the rubble of World War I, led by a man named Joseph Piłsudski. Rather than a petty dictator, as he is sometimes portrayed, I learned that Piłsudski was dynamic, interesting, and an important historical figure whose life can be described as the unlikely combination of George Washington and Robin Hood. His goal was always Polish independence, and this was a perspective that forced him, as circumstances changed, to assume different roles. He was, among other things, a socialist revolutionist. He was a Siberian exile, a prison escapee, a train robber, a military hero, a statesman, diplomat, and head of state. Of course, Poles are aware, particularly at the Institute, of these events, but most Americans are not. This may be because, be because both the East and the West have had reasons to minimize Poland's importance. Among other reasons, the Russians may be embarrassed that tiny Poland handed the Red Army its only unredeemed defeat. Western democracies might fear that a too careful analysis would reveal that despite analog or, um ideological affinities, they have on several occasions abandoned their Polish allies. I thought that the story of Poland and Piłsudski should be better known among non-Poles. Someone should write a book, I thought, why not me? In retrospect, there were a lot of reasons why it should not have been me. Uh, before writing the book, I had never written anything except for technical, geological, and geophysical papers. I had no Polish acquaintances. I had no prior knowledge of Polish history. I had no contacts in academia. I had no knowledge of publishing. At several stages of the project, I was told by my friends, by publishers, and by at least one history professor that I had no business writing such a book. I didn't have the skills or the background. And these are actually valid points. But nothing is so desirable as something denied. And this dynamic helped push me on to finish the book. While working as a full-time geologist, I researched the book at night and I wrote during my lunch hour. After four years, I was able to produce the first edition. As a shot in the dark, I Googled the names of 50 Polish historians and asked them for whatever feedback they might provide. Surprisingly, I got back some helpful responses. In particular, I'd like to thank Rice University professor Ava Thompson and Anna Chinchala, who was professor emeritus of history at the University of Kansas, who provided valuable insights and assistance that improved the second edition. Now on to the Battle of Warsaw. Let's see if this moves. 
Okay. This audience, I understand, will not require much background, but I'll, I'd like to set the stage, the context of the Battle of Warsaw with just a few slides. Looking at a map of 16th century Europe, Poland was easily the largest country in Europe. For most, most of her history, Poland dominated, or at least was co culturally important to her neighbors. At various times, Poles even ruled as kings of Hungary and Bohemia, and once very briefly as Tsar of Russia. Polish soldiers were instrumental in capturing Moscow on three occasions, twice leaving the city largely in ashes. Prussia, which became the nucleus of the German Empire, was for centuries a feudal possession of the Polish crown. And Lithuania, with the union with Lithuania, this created a continental superpower that extended from the Black to the Baltic Sea. Examining a map two centuries later shows no vestige of Poland at all. This tremendous disappearing act is even more perplexing when one realizes that in the intervening years, Poland lost no major wars and was the most militarized country in Europe. The story of the partitions is long and painful, but in short, in 1795, Poland was partitioned for a third and final time by its Austrian, Russian, and Prussian neighbors. Despite widespread resistance and major insurrections in 1831 and 1863, Poland was unable to break the chains of her Germanic and Russian enslavers for over 100 years. Joseph Piłsudski, assume my arrow's working, was born in 1867 in this location here in what was then the Russian Empire and what is now Lithuania. He was raised primarily by his mother to be a Polish patriot at a time that Poland did not exist. As a very brief summary of his life prior to 1920, at age 19, he was, he was exiled to Siberia for five years for part of his part in a plot to kill the Tsar. It was during this time that his two front teeth were extracted by the butt of a Russian rifle and therefore forcing him to sport a flowing mustache for the rest of his life to hide this disfiguration. In 1900, he was arrested again, this time for publishing a subversive underground newspaper. He then escaped the previously escape-proof Warsaw Citadel by pretending an elaborate scheme that made him pretend to be insane for over a year. He went on to be leader of the Socialist Underground, but due to the danger of arrest in Russia, he settled in Austrian-controlled Galicia. As early as 1907, he predicted that within 10 years, there would be a great war in Europe in which the partitioning powers would be involved. According to Przewski, when they were divided and bloodied, that would be the time that Poland would free itself. <clears throat> Despite no formal military training, during this time, he built the nucleus of the Polish military force, which he funded in part by what he called expropri expropriations. In one such example in 1907, he led a group that robbed a Russian mail train. He then went on to use this loot to train Poles for the coming war. He began World War I leading his, his Polish manned but Austrian-controlled legions on a preemptive strike in the Russian territory in 1914. Thanks to his battleshield, battlefield leadership, he was quickly promoted to Austrian Brigadier General, and he spent the next several years fighting on the Eastern Front. But after Russia withdrew from the war in 1917, he refused to swear allegiance to the Kaiser and was imprisoned, imprisoned by the Germans. By November 1918, the Germans knew that they would lose the war and that the Polish state would be reestablished. Rather than see Roman Domowski, whom they considered a Russophile, placed at the helm of a pro-Western state, the Germans decided to release Piłsudski and send him to Warsaw, where they recognized that he would be placed at head of the state. Throughout the war and beyond, Piłsudski was neither pro-German, nor pro-Russian, nor pro-Western, but pro-Polish. And this was the position that outsiders never seemed to grasp. Piłsudski took office as Commander-in-Chief on November 11th, 1918. This is the day that Germany finally admitted defeat, and it's the day celebrated as Polish Independence Day. Two days later, he was appointed Provisional Head of State. 
Rather than establish a dictatorship or favor his old party, the socialists, he announced that he would immediately arrange for free elections and hence reintroduce libertarian principles and a parliament to Poland, resurrecting a republic reminiscent of Poland's proud past. During the first critical years of the Polish Republic, Kaczynski could be described as a centralist who made efforts to unite patriotic elements. Later, when he believed that partisan politics was threatening Polish security, he would become a de facto dictator until his death in 1935. In 1919, the new Poland, dubbed the Second Republic, was accepted by the international community in principle, but its most basic defining feature, borders, was in wide dispute. In the West, Austrians, Czechs, and Germans all claimed part of what many Poles believed was historic Poland. The situation to the East was worse. Russians of all stripes still claimed much of the new Poland. For example, white Russians proclaimed that the borderlands were part of the historic Russian empire. Red Russians, while giving lip service to national self-determination, obviously had every intention of absorbing Slavic states by socialist revolution. Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainians, they all clamored for national independence, and all of them claimed territory that Poles believed belonged to them. As an added element, large swaths of Eastern Europe were still occupied by the German, German troops, who constituted a large, well-armed group of undefeated soldiers, suddenly abandoned by their government, but maintaining military cohesion. These soldiers believed that they were, that they were patrolling their own territory given to them at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. But they received few orders from Berlin, as, uh, as Berlin was in the midst of a Spartacus revolution or an attempted communist takeover of the state. Meanwhile, Poland's borders were, in theory, being decided at the Paris Peace Conference. The main question was not whether Poland should exist, but how. For example, should it be large, like the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or should it be small, like the Duchy of Warsaw? Even at home, Poles were divided on the issue. The Second Polish Republic was heavily influenced by an almost universal awareness and reverence for Polish history. But both the right and the left were keen to restore, restore Poland's greatness while avoiding her historic errors. The problem was that the opposing camps saw, interpret the lessons of Polish history in almost entirely different ways. Piłsudski wanted to recreate a version of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, in which Polishness was not based on ethnicity, but rather on culture and citizenship in a federation. After all, although Piłsudski was the quintessential Pole, he was technically Lithuanian. He therefore thought that the new Poland could include areas where Poles were not in the majority. His National Democratic opponents, led by Roman Domowski, pictured here, believed that a smaller Poland, reduced in ethnic core, would be more unified and less provocative to her neighbors. Domowski, who was better liked in the West than Piłsudski, also thought that a smaller Poland based on an indisputably Polish population would please the West and make it easier to secure their support. But of course, ultimately, Piłsudski determined Polish policy. He decided that while allowing the Entente to establish the Western borders of Poland, he would at least initially extend Polish borders as far East as possible. He reasoned that the eastern borderlands were too complex for Western powers to come up with a clean decision, and that if Poles did not control this area, then the Russians would, and they would use these resources against Poland. Piłsudski believed that Poland must be large or not exist, a barrier to her aggressive neighbors, not a bridge. Piłsudski was also clear that he assumed that the West could not be relied upon to provide timely military aid in times of crisis, and that once they regained their military strength, both Germany and Russia would not hesitate to violate any treaty to regain Polish lands. Considering future events, this appears to be an accurate assessment, as this audience is well aware. On September 1st, 1939, which was approximately four years after Piłsudski died, Germany attacked Poland. 
despite Poland's military alliance with Great Britain and France, neither took military action until the following spring, and then only when France was attacked. Hitler assumed this would be the case because he sent the bulk of his army east, leaving Western Germany largely unprotected. Had France attacked as per her treaty, they may have taken Berlin or at least forced the Germans to call off the attack in Poland. Meanwhile, the Russians watched to gauge Western response, and when, when no military action was forthcoming, they invaded Poland on September 17, 1939. Back in 1919, placing little value on Western opinion and facing weak resistance from local nationalists or the, the uh, preoccupied Russians, Piłsudski led his military forces as far east as Minsk, establishing a perimeter that he thought would not necessarily be Poland's borders, but would be a commanding opening position in negotiations that were sure to follow. In addition, by the end of 1919, Piłsudski was largely successful in either subduing or reaching an arrangement with his Ukrainian, Czech, German, Lithuanian, and Latvian neighbors. And that last question uh, was actually very complex, would take a whole other lecture to explain. While Poland's situation in World War I was difficult, in some ways it was not as dire as Soviet Russia's. After giving away a substantial portion of her eastern territories and the resources that went with them at the 1918 Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the Bolsheviks found themselves being assaulted from all sides. White Russians, who wished to return imperial rule, were advancing with Western-funded armies and Western-equipped armies. Finns, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, and Poles were threatening from the West. And the Reds had to make sure to steer clear of the Germans in the area. At one point, the Bolsheviks were fighting on 15 different fronts simultaneously with no hope of outside help. Moreover, the West did not recognize the Bolshevik government as legitimate. Allied troops were occupying parts of Russia and prominent leaders like Churchill were openly advocating strangling communism in its cradle. Throughout much of 1919, Soviet Russia was fighting for its life and the situation looked grim. In this context, Polish borders were not of primary concern. But soon the Red Armies began to turn the tide. When Bolshevik forces prevailed locally, they were supplied with fresh recruits as disaffected soldiers in opposing armies, particularly those that were susceptible to socialist propaganda, often switched to the winning side. Lenin thought this would become a worldwide phenomenon, which would allow the revolution to spread like wildfire. While fighting white Russian armies, this theory appeared to be valid. White troops facing Soviet armies, unconvinced in the merit of their cause, and for the most part lacking national attachments, often deserted en masse. Therefore, while the white armies faded, the Bolsheviks gained troops and equipment in almost every campaign, becoming stronger as they advanced. Using this formula, the Ukraine and Belarus were easily conquered and converted, at least on paper, to independent Soviet republics. As important as the psychological appeal of Bolshevik propaganda was the retooling of the Red Army under Trotsky. While, like Piłsudski, he had no specific military training, under his direction, the Red Army became a formidable fighting force. But fortunately for Poland, Trotsky was essentially kicked upstairs before the uh, main fighting, the main conflicts in the Polish-Soviet War and replaced by a decidedly less talented commander in chief. The backdrop of the Polish-Soviet War involved a complex series of minor battles, which Churchill rather ungraciously called the War of the Pygmies. In 1919, Poles and Russians were not fully or exclusively engaged and neither was trying to conquer the other. This phase of the war is better described as territorial skirmishes, with both Poles and Russians trying to acquire as much land as possible to shore up their brand new states. But while Poles were trying to reestablish the Polish nation, the Bolsheviks were intent on exporting the revolution worldwide and would not form a country, the USSR, until 1922. 
In early 1920, the conflict between the Soviets and the Poles took a more serious turn. Both sides had spent the prior year successfully building their military forces and consolidating their positions. In the spring, both began preparing for what they believed to be existential threats. Poland feared another national annihilation, while Lenin believed that the revolution would die if confined to Russia. The Soviet plan in 1920 was to send Red armies west into Europe, where they would in theory be welcomed by workers longing for socialism. While not as large as Tsarist armies, they didn't have to be because Europe was weakened by World War I and following the formula established during the Civil War, it was assumed that Soviet forces would grow during the campaign. In general, one group had to do west through Poland and theoretically onto Germany, and the other group went southwest toward Austria and Hungary. It was this movement that precipitated the Polish-Soviet War. The Polish-Soviet War should be considered one of the more consequential conflicts in history, yet outside of Eastern Europe, it is relatively unknown. By 1920, this was more than a territorial squabble or, or border readjustment. It was an existential clash of ideologies, Christianity versus atheism, individual liberty versus state control. Lenin believed that by destroying Poland, he would create a red bridge to Europe which he was certain was right for communist revolution. In 1920, only Poland stood in the way of a socialist takeover of Europe. After just over a year of freedom, Poland was in a precarious position. The Russians had an army of over 5 million men, and they had assembled a large portion of that army, about 800,000 men, for what they called Operation Vistula. Poland countered with about 700,000 men, or a force that was roughly equivalent. However, the Soviets could call for reinforcements from other units, or they could replace any losses by conscripting tens of millions of peasants. The Poles were in an entirely different position. Their men at the front represented virtually the entire Polish army, a force that could not be replaced in any meaningful way. After breaking the Russian code, which the Poles would also do in World War II to the Germans, Piłsudski learned that the Soviets planned to attack Poland in the spring of 1920, as soon as they gathered strength and the weather permitted. The Russian plan was relatively simple. Advance westward and capture Warsaw, just as they, as they had done in several or two uh, prior campaigns in the 19th century. After the fall of their capital, it was assumed that Poles, Polish resistance would collapse and that the workers freed from their white Polish lords would eagerly join the Red Army as it marched westward. The only geographic obstacle in their way, other than a series of north-south training rivers, was the Pripet marshes, which would require the two Soviet fronts to diverge, at least for a while. The northern thrust was dubbed the, south, was dubbed the western front, and it was led by boy wonder Tukhachevsky. I say that because he was 27 years old while the Southwestern Front was commanded by General Yurganov, assisted by a young commissar named Joseph Stalin. To disrupt this plan, Kisusi decided to preemptively attack the Soviet forces south of the Pripet Marshes. He reasoned that the Bolsheviks were not completely ready, they were not completely organized, and because the Southern area would get warmer earlier, it would be conducive to campaigning first. Ideally, <clears throat> ideally, the offense would disrupt Soviet plans and return Ukraine to a government that was friendly to Poland. Once Ukrainians took over in the south, Polish soldiers could then be moved to the north where they could attack Tukhachevsky and or secure impregnable defensive positions. The decision to attack preemptively made military sense. But just as he knew this would anger Western diplomats, but he also knew that their support was largely rhetorical. By now, Western powers had quit uh, supporting white armies militarily, and, were, and they hoped to influence Russia by trade. While the Entente had the luxury to dither, Poland could not wait. To delay would be fatal to the Republic. Rather than allow the Red Army to gain momentum, 
he decided to hit them before they were fully prepared. After securing a partnership with a Ukrainian faction, Jusisi attacked the Southwest Front as soon as the weather allowed. On April 25th, 1920, Polish forces raced eastward against only token resistance. On May 7th, they entered Bolshevik, occup Bolshevik occupied Kiev. Unfortunately, the speed of the offense worked against the Poles, as instead of making a stand and being slaughtered, the Soviet forces simply ran away, and therefore they were available for future battles. Worse, the attack on Kiev had a profound effect on Russian morale. Instead of being dragooned into a questionable political campaign, many Russians now thought that their country had been attacked, and this resulted in hundreds of thousands of patriotic new recruits. In addition, Bolshevik leaders, who had secretly massed a huge army for the target Vistula operation, could now claim that they were only defending their country after an unprovoked attack. Pisiski may have held Kiev, but the Bolsheviks had the high moral, the moral high ground, or at least as far as world opinion was concerned. The Polish attack stirred the Reds into action. The northern concentration of Soviet troops, while still unorganized and not fully manned, began an offensive along the Western Front on May 14th. Dukhachevsky was neither surprised nor concerned that, that the offense did not gain much ground, as his main objective was to keep Polish reinforcements from going to the south. He was confident that once the Red Army was assembled in force, the campaign would be relatively easy. In the south near Kiev, the, army, the Red Army received a boost with the arrival of the 1st Cavalry Army, led by the fierce Cossack horseman Budyanin. This highly mobile force was able to find weaknesses and penetrate Polish lines, forcing Polish troops to withdraw to a new line of defense where the process was repeated. But after, uh, by June, the Poles had retreated to almost where they had begun two months before. But after this point, <clears throat> things began to stabilize in the South. By the time of the critical Battle of Warsaw in August, Poles had a slight advantage on the Southwestern Front. But in any case, Soviet commanders in the Southern group showed little inclination to help their fellow Reds trying to capture Warsaw. In particular, Stalin had ambitions of his own that in this one instance worked to the Poles' advantage. In the North, Tukhachevsky was frustrated by the lack of coordination between the two fronts, but he was receiving a steady supply of fresh recruits and he got a cavalry corps similar to the one Budyany oversaw in the South. The northern horsemen used similar tactics, upflanking poles on the open steps, forcing them to retreat once their position was compromised. Fusiski hoped to use a system of abandoned German trenches that were constructed during the last war for a defensive stand, but not having enough men to occupy them in force, the Russian cavalry was able, able to access the poles rear areas. A similar situation played out along the Boof River, forcing another retreat. These actions, as well as those in the southern Kiev campaign, demonstrate the problem with military operations in the steppes. Offenses were usually initially successful, but there was simply too much open space for armies to defend. But offenses rarely settled the matter, as the open spaces also made it easy for, for defenders to run away. Therefore, for the issue to be decided, both armies would have to be engaged somewhere where the defenders had no place to go. In the summer of 1920, both sides knew that place would be Warsaw. The Entente, meeting in special sessions to assess developments in the war, issued a series of unhelpful, uninformed, and unserious proposals that, for the most part, Kiesiski and Lenin ignored. Instead of divisions, they sent diplomats. The inter-allied mission dispatched to Warsaw in July was comprised of prestigious and well-meaning individuals, but these representatives offered no meaningful assistance, wished to remove Piasuski from command, and were largely ignorant of conditions on the ground. General Vagan, who is shown here in the middle, was a competent general, French general, but he played a very minor role in the subsequent battles. Nonetheless, for political reasons and against his protest, he later received much credit in the West for the Polish victory that was forthcoming. 
by August 1920, the Bolsheviks were on the outskirts of Warsaw, and both sides knew that the ensuing battle would determine the fate of the war. Despite the significance of the battle, Poland stood alone. Western powers sent advisors, not troops. Socialist agitators in Western countries had organized a, bo- a near total boycott of military supplies to Poland. Fortunately, as the Soviets neared the capital, Poles volunteered in large numbers, including women who manned machine guns and civilians who dug trenches, sometimes by torchlight. For purposes of simplicity, the Battle of Warsaw can be broken down into three semi separate but interrelated battles to the north east, and south of Warsaw. The north, over here, the Soviet Fourth Army and the Northern Cavalry Corps arrived ahead, well ahead of the main Russian forces, cutting off and threatening the capital in that direction. In fact, they had planned at one point, if they could get around to the west, they would attack Warsaw from the west, just as the Russians had done in 1831. To the center, in this direction here, and to the northeast, of Warsaw, Soviet troops in the 3rd, 15th, and 16th armies had trudged onward, harassed by deadly Polish rear guard action and hampered by lack of supplies. The slowness of their advance allowed Poles a few critical days to prepare defenses in the capital. The southern flank of the two Kaczewski's forces over here was an undermanned afterthought, strung along a large front. While not ideal, the Soviet commander did not have time. Oh, sorry. The Soviet commander did not have time to shore up this weakness, as from his perspective, the key was to capture Warsaw as soon as possible before Poles were prepared and before the Entente could be convinced to send troops. To counter the Soviets, just Poles had three elements of defense. Uh, Poles defending the northern approaches of the capital were led by General Haller who had returned to France in 1919 at the head of the Blue Army, or this was a Polish army fighting for the Allies in France. These highly trained men had Polish uniforms and equipment, including tanks and airplanes. In addition, France sent many officers who otherwise had little to do after the armistice, and this included young Captain Charles de Gaulle, who witnessed much of the fighting. This is a picture of uh, Kuczynski reviewing Haller's troops, and it's interesting to note that uh, you can see the Adrian uh, French uh, helmets that the the soldiers are wearing. You can also see that the military caps by the officers are quite different. Kuczynski's wearing a round cap, which which he wore in the legions. Haller's has the uh, traditional Krakowian headwear, which is a square cap. And this underscores the fact that the Polish army was this amalgamation of troops that were trained and had different types of equipment, they had different types of caliber rifles, but this was an added element of complexity that Piusisi had to overcome. In August 1920, Haller oversaw the construction of defensive lines near the old Tsar's fortress of Modlin, located here. There, the defenders, which included General Sikorsky's Fifth Army, thought they would confront the smaller amount of Soviet troops but as it turned out, they were instrumental in preventing the passage of two Kachensky's main forces. A central area facing east also is shown here, and this was under the command of General Ritz Smigwi. And they not only had defensive positions along the Vistula, but they also had fortified the important suburb of Razumin, located here. The eastern port approaches were the most fortified and manned Polish positions. It was described as an inferno of barbed wire, trenches, machine guns, and artillery that was expected to repel the main Soviet assault. The Polish forces south of the capital or southeast of the capital were not part of the original plan, but these were the brainchild of Marshal Piłsudski. Unlike his professional Western Western advisors, in early August, Piłsudski determined that the Polish forces were too small for a protracted defense, as this would only invite a war of attrition that the Soviets would welcome. He knew the situation required a bold stroke, not only something that would defeat the Russians, but one that would do it quickly before they could utilize their manpower advantage. 
Following the adage that the best defense is a good offense, Busissi decided that he would attack the Russians at their weakest point. Now, this is a, a rather busy slide, but I'm going to just talk about it in a general sense. Uh, the Russian attack on Warsaw began on August 12, 1920. Uh, there were numerous Polish heroes that were uh, included, but while the, the first day's fighting largely favored the Soviets, within a day or two, the Poles began to turn the tide. Uh, in the north, on August 15th, General, you can see right here, General Sikorsky led a counterattack with his Fifth Army, and this included a brand new volunteer division that sorted out, sorted out of their trenches and drove back a numerically superior Soviet force. The defeat by a large contingent of amateur soldiers did much to weaken Russian resolve. In the east, also on August 15th, uh, the Red Army was chased out of Razumin, which they had taken in the first couple days of fighting. The 16th was another hard day of fighting that largely favored the Poles, Poles facing Tukhachevsky to loosen his grip on Warsaw. Still, the Soviets expected reinforcements soon, and although stymied for the moment, they were confident they would, they, that they would capture the capital in the next assault, particularly if soldiers from the Southern Front would transfer north. As, as per order. Meanwhile, along the southeastern fronts down here, Kosinski launched his counterattack on August 16th. In a move his advisors said broke all the rules, at the height of the crisis, Kosinski had removed men from the Warsaw defenses, and he also had transferred some from the southern front, and assembled them in secret, planning to attack the Red Army at a wide angle. Kosinski recognized that the deployment of the Russian troops presented a unique and fleeting opportunity. Soviet commander Tukhachevsky's rapid advance had left his left flank hanging. The Red Army was now spread out, elongated along a northwest-southeast axis, exposing its soft underbelly to attack. But for months, the Poles had done nothing but retreat. A counteroffensive seemed laughable to the Soviet commander. The plan was risky. The operation demanded daunting logis logistical feats, difficult to accomplish even in peacetime. If the Russians were alert to the danger, they could easily foil Kuzinski's plans. All the regroupings were small groups that were in easy striking distance of the enemy, and therefore they were subject to being defeated in detail. Alternately, if the Soviets made defensive preparations, if they'd simply dug in, Kuzinski's men would have been, been beaten back or at least delayed long enough for the Soviets to take the Warsaw, which would have ended the entire affair. As he always did in times of crisis, Piszczynski assumed full responsibility for the mission. Despite being head of state, he determined to personally lead the counteroffensive, to succeed or die in the effort. Somehow, Polish forces under Piszczynski were able to assemble in secret and attack the unprepared Soviet flank. The Polish strike was so effective or so effectively demolished the Bolsheviks in their path that there was no time to warn adjoining Russian troops, allowing Kaczynski's men to slaughter one isolated, locally outnumbered unit after another. The Soviets lost over 100,000 men at the cost of only, or less than 5,000 Polish dead. Besides eliminating many Soviet troops, Poles captured supplies and weapons, disrupted communications, and prevented Russian reserves from reaching Warsaw. Perhaps as importantly, the assault killed a disproportionate number of Soviet officers who had congregated in what they thought was a safe area in the rear. After the command structure was destroyed, the Russians retreated in dis disarray. All Soviet troops were driven from the capital by August the 18th, and the battle ended officially a week later. However, the Battle of Warsaw did not end the Polish-Soviet War. In fact, there's good reason to believe that had it not been aggressively followed up, the Soviets could have turned the tide. But as Tukhachevsky lamented, Piłsudski did not give him time to regroup. Instead, the Poles chased the reeling Reds for seven weeks until they attempted to make a last stand along the Niemen River, located up here. Although Tukhachevsky commanded more troops and was fighting from defensive positions, 
his men were raw recruits. In addition, many of his trained officers had been killed or captured, and much of his artillery had been abandoned at the gates of Warsaw. Once again, the Poles outflanked the slow-learning Soviets. In this case, they surprised the Soviets by violating Lithuanian territory to sneak around them. And they established then a defensive perimeter as far east as possible before peace negotiations began. In the south, Reds were also decisively beaten, in large part by the biggest cavalry battle of the war and probably the last one of its kind in history. Lenin's bargaining position was not only weakened by defeat in the war, but also by conditions at home that included peasant revolts, industrial strikes, food shortages, naval mutinies, and the fact that they were unable to transfer troops to the Western Front because there was renewed activity in the Crimea by white armies. In short, the Poles were in a dominant position and they were able to secure an acceptable peace, which was actually an armistice. Piłsudski then cons consolidated Poland's position with several defensive alliances, most notably with France. The shocking Polish victory at the miracle on the Vistula ranks upon, among one of the most decisive yet little known battles in Western civilization. Prior to the battle, the Soviets appeared to be an unstoppable force of history, spearheaded by an irresistible people's army. And this caused many in the West to be infatuated with communism as supposedly the wave of the future. The victory secured the Polish state. In addition, by inflicting a clear cut, overwhelming military defeat on the Red Army, the Poles not only prevented the Soviets from physically invading Europe, but also destroyed their aura of invincibility and hence the intoxicating appeal of inevitability. Some say that the Polish victory was miraculous in part because the height of the battle occurred during the Feast of the Assumption and some Catholic Poles claim that they saw the Virgin Mary hover above the battlefield. But the victory can be explained by more mundane means. On the Russian side, the Soviet command completely underestimated and misread the Poles. They did not appreciate that the core of the Polish army was loyal and well-trained. They thought that the Polish force was just another white army that, if given the chance, would desert or change sides. They did not appreciate Poles' historic longing for freedom. In addition, the Western and Southwestern fronts did not coordinate their acti activities. In fact, they worked, often worked at cross purposes as Stalin and others in the Southern Command Wanted, they aspired to lead the revolution into Europe and not play second fiddle to Tukhachevsky. Another reason the Soviets lost was that their model of world revolution was fatally flawed. Lenin thought that the Red Army would gain steam as it reached the masses of workers in the oppressed West, and he was surprised that his army shrank rather than grew in Poland. Instead of a turning point, the defeat by the Polish army made the Soviets turn inward eventually adopting the strategy of socialism in one country. Lenin was even forced to accept some elements of capitalism to, to save his regime, instituting the so-called new economic policy, perhaps not coincidentally, immediately after signing the Treaty of Riga in March 1921. The successful Polish defense of the capital was not as surprising as it might seem. By early August, Poles had stockpiled enough supplies and ammunition to hold off the Soviet assault, at least for a few weeks. By the time the Soviets made it to the outskirts of Warsaw, they were only marginally numerically superior to the Poles who were concentrated behind sturdy defenses. The Soviet supply line was dangerously long and exposed and their underfed and often sick men were exhausted from weeks of forced marches and skirmishes. Unlike the Poles, the Soviets did not have an effective air force and they suffered from poor intelligence. And in general, Polish troops and officers were better trained and performed better. Few people in the borderland willingly supplied the Soviets with either recruits or food. Perhaps most importantly, in the reverse of the situation after the Kiev campaign, the Polish side was animated by patriotism as they saw their newborn country under existential assault. Much of the victory, much of the credit for the victory is given, and rightfully so, to Piłsudski's flanking maneuver. But his counterattack was remarkable, not so much in its conception, 
After all, the exposed Russian flank was somewhat obvious, but in its daring and execution, which, if anything, was the true miracle of the battle. Thanks to Fusiski, Polish independence and civic life was preserved for another two dec decades, during which time the nation had time to experiment with the positives and negatives of democracies. There were several important ramifications of the Polish-Soviet War, but in many cases, they were things that did not occur rather than those that did. Poland did not turn into a Soviet Republic, and the revolution did not spread to the West. But Poland was not able to create a federation of border states or establish good relations in many cases with her neighbors, and therefore much of these lands were incorporated into the Soviet Union. The Russians did not become a respected member of the international community. Instead, they developed a siege mentality, convinced that the rest of the world was out to get them. Stalin, tinged with humiliation, paranoia, and revenge, did not forget that the only unredeemed defeat of the Red Army came at the hands of the Poles, and he would execute the cream of the Polish mil uh, officer corps at Captain Forrest in 1940 to prevent another such occurrence. Stalin did not forget that Poles would not willingly convert to communism or serve foreign masters. And therefore, he instituted a brutal suppressive regime when Poland was, in effect, absorbed by the USSR after the Second World War. The Polish victory in 1920 made Piłsudski an important historical figure. If Warsaw had fallen, he may have been only a minor footnote in Polish history, a Don Quixote-esque figure who had failed at his essential task. While his success in the post-Soviet War was of immense importance to Poland, on a personal note, without this victory, there would have been little reason for a geologist from Texas to write his biography, learn about Polish history, or to be speaking to you today, all things for which I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it was a really great lecture with a lot of history and very well delivered. Um, Maybe we can uh, close our screen and uh, get back to uh, talk a little bit. I would like to uh, welcome everyone uh, to ask questions via Q&A and uh, via chat, whatever you prefer. And uh, I will start first. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Hatterington, um, about the maps because the maps in the lecture are very well prepared and it's, uh, they make uh, to understand the uh, uh, Battle of Warsaw much better. So I'd like to ask you, how did you come up with the maps? How did you make them available? Where did you find them? Uh, they, uh, Dr. Google is the short answer. Uh, it, it, uh, what the, the simple map, that the one I started with with the three elements was from Norman Davies. Uh, I believe that was um, it, it was uh, from White Eagle Red Star, and then the more complex one was actually just a Wikipedia article on the Battle of Warsaw that I modified. Now both of them I modified a little bit, but so uh, yeah, without maps, you can't really understand the battle. Yeah, so this is really a great point to uh, to include maps into the presentation. Uh, because uh, this makes you know whole battle much easier to understand. Also, uh, I would like to um, get back to the title of your uh, presentation, miracle, miracle or turning point that would not turn. So, if you can uh, explain a little bit, uh, what did you meant by putting this title? Well, the. When you read about uh, the Battle of Warsaw and the Polish Soviet War, I mean, Battle of Warsaw particularly, it's the miracle on the Vistula. And there's been a lot of question about, you know, was it really a miracle? I was uh, trying to show that militarily, no, it was not. And I didn't bring it up, but uh, actually the, the title, uh, Miracle on the Vistula, was, was originally bestowed upon uh, the battle by a National Democrat opponent of Pusiski who used the yes. term miracle derisively to mean, oh, he got lucky. Uh, but I don't think the Poles got lucky. I mean, they, you, they earned the victory at the Battle of Warsaw. And the turning point that would not turn was that, uh, that Lenin discovered 
that world revolution was not as easy as he thought it was going to be. He thought that this was going to be like a, a wildfire that would spread throughout the world. And that, you know, he believed in the Marxist theory that of the dialectic of, of history where, you know, history progressed a certain path and that capitalism had its phase and that history was now uh, evolving to where socialism and then communism would take over. So he was surprised that it would not turn. So the, the, this, uh, this battle was pivotal in, in those respects. Very good, it's a great explanation. And um, I would like to also ask you about uh, uh, Joseph Piłsudski, as we say in Polish, Józef Piłsudski. Um, it seems to me that he became your hero, that this is because of him you wrote these books, that because you find out about his uh, biography, maybe about the uh, Battle of uh, Warsaw and all other events that, uh, he uh, is so close to you. So can you say a few words about it? Uh, yes, what, what's, I, when I was reading about actually a tree of Versailles, you know, Piusiski and Domowski kind of came out and they would describe Piusiski. They had little vignettes that he had escaped from prison and he had, you know, he had been involved with the Poppy Hill and all little things. So, you know, it sounded very interesting. So I went and I wrote, I read a couple biographies and I was shocked about how different they were. One was written by his wife, and you can expect you know, that to be kind of a, a hero worship. And then the other ones were written, as I found out later, they were kind of under the Russian um, regime and where he was, he was very much, uh, it, was, it was very negative on him. So, I mean, you had this glowing report and you had this negative. And I said, well, no one is like that. They have to be in between. So, you know, as a, as a typical politician or people view it, he was either great or horrible. And he was really a flesh and blood human being I didn't have any, uh, I, I was objective as I could be because I didn't have any background or I didn't really have any pre uh, conceptions of what he should be. So I wanted to find out the truth and that just kind of started me down the path. And I, I think that the history, even though he had his foibles and there were some moments that were very dark, the balance of history was that he was a great man, in my opinion. Thank you very much, because he is a truly a um, very important person in Polish history, and without Piłsudski, there would be no uh, independent Poland, there would be no regaining independence, so he uh, is uh, very um, important to our history. Um, I would also uh, like to ask you about the sources for the book, because as we can see, the book in English it has uh, many pages i'll just turn one and see how many pages is here but this is like 750 so this is a lot of uh, material here so that uh, i want to ask you uh, how did you come with the sources and how did you put your studies uh, where did you go where did you look for the material whether it was everything books and internet or you had uh, other choices uh, I started off with kind of the basic um, Polish history that you can find in English and, and that probably uh, Norman Davies is considered, you know, he has written a lot and, you, you know, he has four or five books. And once you get through God's Playground and others, you know, you've got a pretty good background. And then he had a bunch of resources that he, you know, you could follow the trail and find those resources. And then I also uh, was able to um, communicate with Ava Thompson at Rice University and she allowed me access to the rice library and there i found a bunch of resources and um and particularly in the second edition uh people would send me oh have you read this have you read that and i even got some people that because i don't speak polish they, they would send me polish tra uh, translation so once it, it uh, once i started i was able i at the end at the end i probably ended up reading 150 books on polish history or you know related so um uh, i you know was pretty steeped in it at that at that time but I, again, I'm not, I wasn't trying, uh, one of the complaints, uh, people say, well, this is derivative, you're just telling the story, you know, it's not a groundbreaking, and that, that wasn't my intent. My intent was just to put it all in one spot for, so that people could read, and I was just trying to tell the story of what happened. I wasn't trying to really say why it happened or if it was good or bad, so, and I wanted to be comprehensive from his birth to his death, and that's why it was 723 pages. Thank you for that answer, because uh, in this, uh, your books, uh, that one in English, that one which came up in Polish, which is a little shorter, 
it's very well written and it's a very great educational source. As you said, basic knowledge, but uh, very well put in a, into the um, uh, action. And it's step by step, it's uh, telling uh, Pisutki stories, but also the story of Poland for uh, someone who may be not that much familiar with it, especially English speaking uh, 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 readers. So this is really great and uh, helps a lot in uh, educating uh, um, people who do not speak Polish and maybe they have no good uh, choices for, uh, for the book. So this book gives a lot of hope for anyone who is very much interested in uh, Polish history. I think I would ask you the last question, asking, we were speaking about it before our lecture, about your future books uh, regarding maybe Polish history or maybe something else. So if you give us a few hints about what you're working on in your lunchtime. <laughs> well, uh, as I said, I'm a geologist and I, and I like history and I'm writing a book on, um, it's, a, it's more of a geological era in history and it's the history of the earth and the organization of social, of society based on the laws of thermodynamics, which is a very odd thing. Um, the book will probably be out next year. It's called The Power Matrix. It has nothing to do with Polish history. But after that, I'm, I'm very hopeful of uh, starting a project on Sobieski. I think that partly because there's so many parallels with Sobieski and Piłsudski, they, you know, they were, you know, Sobieski lifted the siege of Vienna, saved Western civilization. I mean, there, there's a whole series of parallels between them. And, um, I the the books I've read in English on Sobieski I think he uh, I think they're they're not as comprehensive and they're they're just not exactly what I like so that is probably my next Polish project. Thank you. So it seems that your time will be very busy. Uh, even if you retire, you still will have a lot of work and a lot of readings. Um, I would like to. Um, uh, say that in few days we will have another anniversary of uh, Battle of Warsaw. Uh, there will be 101 anniversary. Last year we are celebrating the one, the round 100. So um, I'm glad that uh, we could uh, uh, today present your lecture to English speaking uh, friends and uh, members of the Institute. And I would like to thank you very much for your time, time, for your great uh, presentation, lecture, great maps, and I would like to wish you uh, all the best in writing about Polish history. And I would like uh, to welcome everyone to read your books in English or in Polish, and also uh, visit our website and be a part of the Institute, uh, uh, see what other uh, great, uh, online uh, films and stories we prepared for you. So thank you very much, Mr. Hartington. And uh, I am pleased to have you as a guest and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you, I enjoyed it, it was fun. Thank you. Take care, okay. bye, bye. Bye.